Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Hopefully you're well. Welcome to the first weekend of spring. It's just so beautiful to have the sun out and we're in Lent, the season of Lent. We're a week away from Passion Week, a couple weeks away from Resurrection Sunday. We're so happy you're with us. Let's take some time and just sing and celebrate. Why don't you join us? We could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh we live for you.
this in the truth that when we build our lives on you, you are the firm foundation. So we come in this rhythm of gathering, of weekly getting together as a community. We just say, King Jesus, that we build our lives on you. You are the foundation, you are the rock, and you are our source of everything. And I pray, God, that that would just be something that would just kind of manifest itself in every word, lyric, song, everything that happens as we're together today. May you be lifted up. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Well, brothers and sisters, it's great to be together, and we have a great morning, some exciting things to share this morning as well, just about the future. But as always, we take some time as a community just to read the Psalms together. And so let's do that together this morning. Psalm 51, say it with faith wherever you're from. A Psalm, um, wherever you're watching from, a Psalm of repentance. Let's say it together. Say it with me. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, only you, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. And brothers and sisters, I just hope uh, as we journey with God and do life with God, that is the very reason why we live and exist, that we would find wisdom from God in the secret place. Amen. Amen. Well, let's do this. Take a second, fire on your camera, say what's up. Hello. Good to see you. And uh, there some of you are. Hi, hi. Great to be together today and uh, take some time together just to be together in community. Here's what we're going to do. We're actually going to jump right in. I'm going to jump right into the teaching because at the end, we have some really exciting things to share about Easter and kind of the future of our community this spring. And I'm excited. So I thought we'll, we'll save that kind of for the end and share kind of a couple next steps uh, for us as a community as we peer in to the Easter season. I hope you're well, and again, thanks for joining us. If you have a Bible you want to join us, we have been in the Old Testament book of Song of Songs. If you want to turn and flip with me to Song of Songs, chapter 6, that's where we're going to be for a few minutes today. Uh, last week, our family, while well, you're turning there, last week, our family had a movie night. And to be honest, this doesn't happen a ton, but we all sat down and we watched a film together on Netflix called Yes Day. Now, here's the thing. I promise you, no spoilers. I rarely ever reference new movies because I know the danger of um, kind of, you know, the spoiling it for everybody and being that guy. So rarely do I do this, but we were watching this movie and it was just really compelling. So the, the story is, it's a story about a family whose 14-year-old daughter is sick of the rules her parents, but especially her mom, is handing down in the home. So the mom is kind of feeling like she's losing her kids, especially her 14-year-old daughter, because over and over she is telling them no. So somebody suggests, they're at this function or whatever, and somebody suggests to them that they should do this thing called a yes day. A yes day. You should do a yes day. Essentially, a yes day is a day where you can't say no to anything over a 24-hour period. So outside of a couple rules, I think they couldn't drive like 20 miles from home and you couldn't ask for things in the future. Everything during the yes day, the parents had to say yes to. Sounds ridiculous, right? Come on, somebody. Sounds pretty ridiculous. So this poor mom is trying to be buddy-buddy with her kids because she thinks she's being mean, which, by the way, is like another teaching like series for another time. And she's caught in this pr predicament of having this yes day. So this family of four has a 24-hour period where they are not allowed to say no. And of course, what do you think happens? It seems amazing at first, right? You have no boundaries until everything goes to crap. To legit, and this isn't a spoiler, this doesn't actually happen, but to legit, you actually burn the house down. 
So here I am watching this movie and I'm smiling in the corner of the couch and Heather keeps peering at me because she knows that I can't like watch or engage things without thinking about the philosophical and theological implications. And I am just sitting there ear to ear with a grin on my face, knowing where this film in this movie is heading. It's te I'm, I'm just like all bubbling with joy because it's teaching my kids as they watch it something very important. And I've just got to say, I love when movies teach fundamental truth. Uh, they just kind of do it for you. I love that. So here I am. I'm sitting. I'm smiling. And this movie is teaching my kids that an unhindered, undisciplined life with no boundaries is, wait for it, it's destructive. It's completely destructive. You throw up your ice cream, you get arrested and go to jail, you legit burn the house down. Like a yes day, I'm just sitting there, I'm thinking, man, this is so great. A yes day is actually a destructive thing. Now the funny thing is this, is after, I don't know where you get your kind of your social media from, my primary social media comes from this thing called Twitter, purely because that's where a lot of theological and philosophical and psychological voices are. So a lot of you guys, your primary source is the gram. You like the pictures and stuff, which is fantastic. But for me, it's just always been Twitter. And so afterwards, after watching this movie, I went on Twitter and the hashtag yes day challenge was actually trending at the time because the movie had just come out. And it was just so funny to watch the responses because there were people everywhere saying and declaring, you need a yes day. You need a, a, a yes day. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I actually think, I think the movie's actually trying to teach us something opposite. And so I'm, I'm reading through these hashtags and the best thing is there's this blogger a number of years ago, even before the film had come out, that suggested that everybody needs a yes day. And so I started to read her work, her blog, and listen to what she says. This are her, these are her ground rules for a yes day. No one can make dangerous regrets. Kids needed to agree on all the requests on a yes day. Um, the car can't go, you can't travel less than 30 minutes in length. All requests needed to be for, the, uh, all requests needed to be for this one day, for this one 24 hour period. And each kid can request at least a $10 purchase at maximum, which when you think about it is actually, by the way, these kind of rules kind of sound oppressive, right? More like a yes day with a bunch of rules. And as I was reading, I just got laughing because that's exactly the point. This really isn't a yes day. This is, this is uh, as what she was sharing, I thought this is actually going against maybe even what a yes day is in people's minds because there's boundaries around even your very own yes day. Now, all this to say, that it's interesting that we live in a world that doesn't necessarily want boundaries. And you may think I'm morbid, but as I was watching this movie, not only was I delighted with where it was headed and what it was teaching my kids, it also kind of, and you're gonna think I'm crazy, but it got me thinking about hell, right? Welcome to church. Got me thinking about hell. Uh, C.S. Lewis describes hell as not being locked on the outside, but on the inside. The idea is that God hasn't locked humans in from the outside, but that we actually as free agents lock ourselves on the inside. The idea is that in this free world teeming with beauty and potential and free will for us, that we can do whatever we want. And, and the reality is, is if we want an unbound, unhindered and free life apart from God and his wisdom, we, we can have that but we're locked from the inside. We will, I know you and I know myself, we will self implode when we don't have God's wisdom. And so I'm thinking about just the implications of all that we've been talking about the last number of weeks and actually months at Praxis around sex and sexuality. I've been thinking a lot about the culture's view of sex and how a lot of people point to God and some of the boundaries as very restrictive and old school and old fashioned. And yet this movie just continued to put before me, man, a life unhindered, a life without boundaries. Well, the movie shows it right before us. It is destructive. There's actually a powerful moment at the end. Again, I know I said no spoilers, I promise. You can still watch it with full integrity. But there's a moment at the end where the 14-year-old daughter is like lost and she's in a place where she shouldn't be and she hears the voice of her mother. And I'm just like, of course, Drew Fest, I'm just like crying 
because this 14 year old then begin, begins to realize that she all of a sudden begins to realize that the oppressive rule giving mom is actually someone who is wise and knows what she's doing and is in all her boundary giving loving. And I thought, what a picture of God. You know, Heather's there thinking, yeah, this is great for moms because it just kind of shows that we actually do care. But even on a deeper kind of theological level, it gives a beautiful picture of God hearing his voice and knowing that the way he's created us and the way that he's wired us together is for intention and purpose. You know, a lot of the conversations right now around sex and sexuality are just like do's and don'ts and the culture has a posture and the church kind of leans into this orthodox way and there's all these clashes and I think, man, just that picture of God's voice coming as this reassuring thing to us to draw us into his love. We can't talk about this without talking about the unending love of God. So obviously you can tell, this is a little bit of an intro, but like this has got me thinking a lot about God in our current cultural moment. And it's especially got me thinking about things like sex and sexuality. In our culture, we want to be autonomous. We want to be unhindered. But the reality, like if you look at it, and I'm not an alarmist in any ways, you guys know that, know me. Though Those of you that know me know I'm not an alarmist, but we are burning the house down, just to let you know. This week, uh, just going through stat upon stat around sexual violence and abuse, both inside and outside the church, I could throw up a slide right now and pile on stat after stat around how we as humans are burning the house down. And one of the things is we don't want, we, there's a tendency in culture to not want any authority in this area of sex and what we do with our bodies. And one thing we've been trying to say through the Song of Songs is it actually gives a really beautiful picture you know, a lot of uh, the past has been drawn in the church, especially in North American culture, to kind of sweep sex under the rug and kind of view it as a dirty thing. And yet we are these people that are saying we can't live unhinged. We can't live as the culture may live. But we also have to step out from maybe some of the ways the church has painted this over the years. This week, a famous TV host, many of you would know him, was asked about a recent statement that the Vatican and the Pope had made about a particular orthodox sexual ethic. And by the way, the Catholic Church has believed this for centuries. And this particular host did not like what was said from the Vatican. And he said this, God is not about hindering people or even judging people. God's not about hindering people and judging us, right? This is kind of his thought. It's just the picture before us that we all want a yes day. But my question would be is, how's that going for us? Like that mom in the film, in the movie, is are her boundaries actually loving and gracious and beautiful? Could we see God's boundaries and God and uh, in, in his love for us? Could we see that as a, a, a way in which we could live under his rule and reign? A few years ago, uh, I spent some time academically researching the connection between the sexual revolution of the 60s and the religious right. And so my nose was kind of in book after book, just looking at the sexual revolution and how that kind of had sp kind of spawned on in the 80s and 90s, something as you may know as the moral majority or the religious right. And I found a few things, there were a few fascinating things in this research. First, it seems like the sexual revolution evolved in large part to the anti-sexual tradition of the church and the cultural double standard that was taking place in the United States in the 50s. And what I simply mean by that is, it seems as though the sexual revolution was spurred on in part because of the church's posture. J. Ruzemsma uh, said this, he said, the unholy alliance between Greek and biblical thought had a crippling effect on sexual morality. But, it managed even worse things. The alliance led Christian teachers to develop a theology under their influence of Greek thought and so to estrange Christian thinking from the Bible itself. He goes on to say, for sexual uh, morality, this was disastrous. For this is where Christendom's unbiblical anti-sex and anti-passion tradition actually began. In his book, Make Love, Not War, The Sexual Revolution, An Unfettered History, 
David Allen talks about the cultural double standard that was happening around the time of the revolution. He says this, each new generation of young girls was indoctrinated with the same message. A woman's virginity is her most precious commodity. In the 50s, as Americans reveled in the return to normalcy after years of depression and war, the double standard was reaffirmed in books, in movies, in television shows, and popular magazines. American males were told that if they were healthy, they should hunger for sex, while young women were advised to resist forcefully and demand a ring. And he goes on and talks about that this so-called double standard was prime soil for the cultural explosion around sexuality that would rebel against the cultural norm and ultimately, as we know, rock America and North America to its core. And so there's some responsibility in kind of the anti-sex posture from the church around the revolution. The other thing I noticed, though, is that the sexual revolution blurred the lines between liberation and exploitation and led to significant violence against women. And this is just history. So another author says this, in critiquing the sexual revolution in modern America, they said this, the sexual revolution has freed America from her traditional Puritan Puritanism uh, with its accompanying guilt, but it has also turned love into physical performance, a hygienic act from which mystery is actually excluded. Susan Hanks would go on, a writer, and she would say this. She wrote a short essay in The Sexual Revolution and Violence Against Women, The Boundary Between Liberation and Exploitation, and she says this. In it, she identifies that the sexual revolution allowed men and women the freedom necessary to creatively explore and educate themselves about healthy human sexuality without the intrusions of social sanctions. And so Hanks was very much compelled that certain aspects of the sexual revolution were actually important for American culture. In the, sec in the 60s, sexuality became more uh, analyzed, which enabled Americans to better educate themselves, which is actually a good thing. The education that came from the re revolution was a good thing. But, but Hanks actually goes on and says this. She says, in this evolutionary process, Traditional boundaries of sexual morality were inev inevitably crossed. As a consequence, the line between one's, one person's liberation and another person's exploitation sometimes became unclear. And this point must not be missed in, in her critique. Her driving objective here is that there were many grave implications that stem from the sexual revolution of the 60s. Along with liberation and freedom came exploitation of women and domestic violence. In quote, she says that strange rape, uh, strange, sorry, stranger rape, spousal abuse, incest, and pornography would all be used to exemplify the old age phenomenon of violence against women. Quite simply, liberation and exploitation went hand in hand. So though there were some good things in education, there was a lot of exploitation that began to happen. Some of you will say, well, that's happened from the dawn of time, but it, it seemed like this was coming to the forefront. The third thing that we learned, that I learned through this process of looking at the sexual revolution in the church, is that it was the church's response to the sexual revolution that actually led to the rise of the religious right in the 80s and the 90s, with the focus on moving women from public space to private influence. So basically, at the core of the re religious right was undoubtedly a reaction to the sexual revolution. I believe the sexual revolution of the 60s laid kind of a, a path for in the 80s, the 70s, 70s, late 70s, 80s, and 90s for this moral majority to kind of rise up. In many ways, the birth of the religious right was a cultural cause and effect. It was a backlash against liberal values and the Supreme Court's decisions over the years on things like pornography, abortion, and the ruling to take prayer out of school. And though conservative Christians had always been kind of active in politics, you know that in the 80s, this was kind of like the first time where there was significant partisan commitment and allegiance to this cause. 
Conservative Christianity and partisan politics went hand in hand in the coming years. And unlike previous decades, a new form of fundamentalism was seen as necessary because of diminishing Ameri- what they thought was diminishing American values, which were directly rooted in the sexual revolution. And if we just had time to talk about the 80s and 90s and the religious right and the moral majority, my goodness, there's so much to talk there. The point in all of this is, you're like, what the, what's the point of all this jargon and talk? The point is, here we lay, okay, so it's 2021, here we lay in the wake of both the sexual revolution of the 60s and the demise of the religious right over the 80s and 90s and into the turn of the 21st century, which included purity culture, which we've talked about. And it seems, maybe this is just me, this is my opinion, it seems like none of this has worked. Is anybody with me? The sexual revolution of the 60s, the moral majority, the religious right, we just lay here in the 21st century moving forward as a society and a people in North America. And it just doesn't seem like it has worked. And this is like the mother of all intros, just to remind us that when you get to the Song of Songs, a a, a poetic book, right, from thousands of years ago, that's teaching us basically that sex is good and that desire and attraction are a part of the human experience. This is what we've been learning. And it ultimately teaches us that boundaries and timing and beauty can exist together. So all we've experienced over the last 50, 70 years, it is what it is. But we actually feel like we want to turn our hearts back to something thousands of years old to show us that these things can coexist, that boundaries and beauty can actually coexist together. Now, with all that said, I know, like, again, the the intro here was like the majority of the teaching for this week. What I want to do is I just want to take a minute and open up Song of Songs 6 and 7, look at another poem here quickly, and just show you, again, that the Bible is not suppressing these ideas of desire and attraction and beauty. If anything, what it's doing in the right context and in the right boundaries is showing us a way of love. And that even gets down to erotic love in our own lives, which is... A story many of us have never heard in the church and is such an important thing to talk about. So, Song of Songs 6, Tremper Longman, he says this about what we're going to read. He says that this is the most erotic, striking, and sensuous speech in the song. These poems in which the man describes the woman's physical beauty and the woman lingers on the man's appealing appearance. He goes on to say, the descriptions begin with either the partner's head or feet and then work down or uh, or up to object to the object, sorry, of erotic focus. Neither the man or the woman is a prude. They celebrate every part of their lover's body. That said, these poems are not crude. Rather, they speak in terms of tasteful metaphors that arouse as they both reveal and conceal the person that they describe. Such poems intend to inspire married couples to revel in their spouse's bodily beauty. And so what we're going to read here is a, a male talking about this female and her beauty. And he actually starts with his description from her feet and moves up her body with loving compliments. So let's read it together. And guys, if you're married, here you go. You just take a little pen out and translate it into modern day verbiage. The friends say this in verse 13, Song of Songs 6. The friends say, come back, come back, O Shulamite. Come back, come back that we may gaze on you. And then he says this, why would you gaze on the Shulamite as on the dance of Mahanam? Flip to uh, chapter seven. The man says this, how beautiful your sandaled feet, O prince's daughter. Your gracious lungs are like jewels, the work of an artist's hands. Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat enriched by lilies. And I'll also say, just be careful with some of the old uh, kind of language here from the ancient Middle East. But anyways, verse 3, your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are like the pools of Heshbon by the gate of Bath-Rabim. 
Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon looking toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is like royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its tresses. How beautiful you are and how pleasing my love with your delights. Your statue is like that of the palm and your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree. I will climb the palm tree. I will take hold of its fruit. And that means probably what you're thinking it means. May your breasts be like clusters of grapes on the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. So, I mean, it's racy. Yes, that's the point. This is the Bible. And the opening banter here between the women of Jerusalem and this particular woman, again, the daughters of Jerusalem or daughters of Zion, makes it clear that this woman is actually dancing. And they ask her to turn, to actually turn around. And she responds by asking why they are so fixed on her. And she compares their gaze to that of the movements of two armies on the battlefield, which it's kind of odd to talk about somebody gazing on somebody and kind of using war or battle as a metaphor. And it may seem strange to us that she compares that in this way. But what we should do is imagine the scene of battle from a point of overlooking the battlefield. As the two armies encounter one another, who could turn their eyes from the scene as they watch the strategic moves and counter moves of attack and defense? The beauty of this woman, the Shulamite, draws the same kind of awestruck attention. And so, again, we're confronted that beauty, attraction, is part of our story. That this man does not hold back and in return, neither does the woman. And that this is in the Bible and this shows us, I think, a a picture of how desire in marriage can be drawn out. How this can be lived out. And the poetry here that surrounds describing this woman, I think, is intentional. So often what we can do is we've talked, we can just kind of make this allegory and I totally get that. But I think part of the way we've tried to posture ourselves towards these poems is that this is unhindered love from this man towards this woman. Now here's where I wanna close before we get into some fun in our future. Um, this woman is called the Shulamite. And that may, not, may, that may not be a big deal to you when you read, but actually the term in Hebrew is that she's called the Shulamite. The Shulamite. So, We know that because there's like the before Shulamite, that this is not a personal name. This is not her personal name. Some think maybe it could refer to the village in which she came from, as with the ancient uh, kind of Mediterranean and ancient Near East. Oftentimes people's names were looped in with where they're from. Just read the Gospels and you'll see that as well. But I actually think there's more significance in the meaning of her name here. And I don't want you guys to miss this. I don't want you to miss this. Shulamite is actually, in Hebrew, is actually formed from the common and well-known Hebrew word, and some of you, it may be kind of springing up within you when you hear it, this word, shalom. Shalom. Now, I think that's actually intentional. I think she's called the Shulamite because of its connection to the Hebrew word shalom. It's, not, it's also not coincidental that the only other person in Song of Songs given a name has their name built on the same root word. So here we have Shulamite, but we also read a, another name in uh, the poems called Shilomo. Both of them with their root in this word Shalom. Now, you may be, may be thinking, man, I just want to eat lunch. This whole Hebrew stuff doesn't matter. But I actually think it's trying to share something with us. Not only is the word shalom deep and rich and beautiful, but think with me for a second. Where do we find this word? We find this word in the garden. We find this word in the garden. The garden is a place, and you have to remember, when we read Song of Songs, there's all sorts of imagery pushing us back to the garden. And we find shalom in the garden. And shalom is a word that we would probably today translate peace. But even there, there's something missing in our English word peace. When we think of peace, we often think about the absence of war or conflict, but the word shalom or peace in English is way, way, way deeper. It means wholeness. It means togetherness. It means um, perfection. It means 
uh, wholeness and, and beauty. And I think of this word shalom and all that it means. It me- doesn't mean just an absence of war. It means perfection, wholeness, beauty together. And this is what we see in the garden. Everything is good and nothing is tainted. And the picture I think we get is a push back to the garden and what we see as far as shalom and peace before the adversary comes and humanity is torn apart at the seams through the fall. But then I also think it pushes us towards another peace and another glimpse of shalom, which is the new earth. And so I don't think we can talk about Song of Songs and all the implicitly sexual stuff, absolutely all that's in there. And it is erotic love poetry without continuing to push back to the garden and then to push forward to our future as a renewed humanity. Just want to close with this and just remind us that when we talk about sex and sexuality, we talk about boundaries and beauty, we talk about everything that we've learned over the last couple of months. Ultimately, sex is a foretaste of heaven. Sex for us is a foretaste of the new earth. Shalom, peace, wholeness. Just as it was in the garden, we get a picture that the ultimate place of shalom, as though God was walking in the cool of the day with a proto-human in the garden, now God will walk in the cool of the day with us in the new earth and Jesus will be at the center. So sex, in the right context, in the right boundary, in this relationship that we're called to, is actually a foretaste of heaven. So over and over we get these questions like, are we going to be married in heaven? People talk about the the new earth and I don't have all the answers. Certainly I don't have all the answers. The one thing I know that's explicitly clear from the scriptures is that heaven is coming here. Heaven is coming to earth, that God's space is coming to human space. But people will often ask, will we be married? And Jesus alludes to the fact that we won't. And for some of us that have been married and you actually like really love your husband or wife, you're like, that I love Heather. Like, I love everything about her. I want to be with her forever. And yet it also gives us a picture that, again, sex is a foretaste of the new earth. And though Jesus says we won't be married and someday I hope I'll, I'll be maybe on the same street as Heather or whatever, the, how that works out, the picture we get is that heaven and earth come together and it is complete peace and shalom. And because of this, heaven will be like unending pleasure. What we experience in the physical right now as far as pleasure in sexual relationships now will actually be a foretaste that heaven will be unending pleasure forever. And so in some ways, sex is this temporary thing, this idea even of what we get here about the beauty and the talking back and forth and the peace that's at play, the imagery when you read it in Hebrew, the peace that's at play, that's also a foretaste of our future forever. forever. Whether you're like Jesus, who never had a sexual encounter in his life, or you've been married for 50 years, or whatever you've done with your body over your life, the picture for us of the renewed humanity is that sex is actually pushing us to bigger ideas. And that is eternal pleasure forever with God. And so one of the things you learn as we read through the scriptures and as we read through these things, that there's always something under it. Always something pushing us forward. In a world that is like hypersexual and is obsessed with sex, we say that this idea of shalom and peace actually pushes us forward. Just as proto-human in the garden was living in complete peace, we too will uh, live in that same state in the future. And one of the things sex shows us is that heaven will be never ending pleasure. And we can't read it without this in mind. It's important for us to engage this. And so as we read through and as we wrestle through in the coming days, coming weeks around sexuality and sexual issues, one of the things we need to do is keep this kind of this big theme in front of us. Heaven is coming to earth and it will be Everything that we long for in trying to connect with each other, it will be fulfilled. Are you with me? That is the future. That's the hope. For when we started this community, the one thing I wanted to continue to put before us is we are actually heading somewhere. And all the talk about sex and everything the culture wants to talk about as far as sex, and even in the church, often the way the church is postured, and Mike has said this too in his teachings, we've just missed it, the important conversation that needs to happen. We are progressing somewhere, and that is to a renewed earth where every longing inside of us will be met. It's beautiful. 
With all this said, I hope you're hanging in there. What we want to do is take two minutes here and bring you up to speed on uh, a couple things happening in the community over the next little while as we look to uh, Easter in a couple weeks and then as well to regular uh, gatherings after Easter. Starting next week, just to give you a heads up, next week we're going to have an online gathering, obviously online. It's not going to be on Zoom. We're going to give everybody a little bit of a break on Zoom. At 10.30 on YouTube, our Facebook page, and at mypraxis.church, we are going to have a liturgy that will finish off, a service, a gathering, that will finish off our walk through the Song of Songs. There'll be music. There'll be teaching in the Song of Songs, and there'll be some reflect, reflection uh, for Palm Sunday, because next Sunday is Palm Sunday, which is beautiful. So we're not going to be in Zoom. We hope you can join us at 1030 next Sunday. Join us online, Facebook, YouTube, and uh, on our, on our um, website, which is great. But we all also are getting ready for Easter. and wanted to let you know that we have a couple things that you can participate in for Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. First of all, on Good Friday, which is April the 2nd, at 10 a.m., we are going to be hosting some Good Friday hikes. We're really excited about this. In small groups, we're gonna get you to register if you wanna join us. We have some options for hikes as a community. We're gonna to hike together in small kind of communities. And then at the end, there's gonna be a quick reflection and communion that we'll bring for you from one of our leaders. And so if you'd like to join us on a Good Friday hike, they're gonna happen at 10 a.m. All of this will go to our website tomorrow. On the front page, you can register for this tomorrow, which is Monday. And we'll also give you an option as far as which kind of terrain you'd like. We'll give you a train option as far as if you want to walk, uh, kind of hike, or you want to walk along the river. We're going to have a couple different options for you there. And so we hope that you can join us for that 10 a.m. And we'll be following all like health protocols. We'll ask you to wear a mask um, and make sure that everything is good that way. But it'll give us an opportunity to walk and then reflect with each other for a few minutes from 10 to 11 on Good Friday morning. We'll also have a Good Friday liturgy that's available starting at 8 a.m. on Good Friday. And that'll be available for you to watch throughout the day. In that will be uh, some new music that our community is recording as well as a time of reflection and uh, we're going to just have a good, good Friday reflection, a, a short little teaching just to reflect on the cross at Good Friday that you can access at any, any point starting at 8 a.m. Then on Resurrection Sunday, we're just really excited to gather together. We're going to have two gatherings on this day. They, they will be identical. They'll be pretty similar. The first will be online at 1030 a.m. Not on Zoom, but what you can do is you can join us on Facebook Live, on YouTube Live, and you can join us at mypraxis.church. It'll all be in the same spot. You'll see exactly the same thing in those, uh, in those different avenues and areas. At 1030, we're going to have a Resurrection Sunday gathering, which we're excited about online. There'll be music teaching, some stuff for the kids. It's going to be brilliant. We'll have a, a great time. But we're also offering in the evening on Resurrection Sunday, on Easter Sunday, an in-person gathering. At 5 p.m., we are going to be gathering at Village Green Community Church. And uh, our friends at, are kind of our new friends now at Village Green are letting us use their building, which is fantastic. And we're going to kind of enter into uh, renting that building. And so we are going to have an in-person gathering. I think there's another slide just to show you the space that's available on in this building. And they've just been so just wonderful to us. And so we're going to host our Easter Sunday gathering in the evening. And so we encourage you, if you're going to join us in the evening, you don't need to join in in the morning. It's going to be basically the same thing. But we would really love for you to join us, if you can, on that Sunday evening. And we're just going to have a great time celebrating resurrection together, socially distanced, with masks, following protocols, but trying to create a place and space where we can kind of be back together to celebrate resurrection. You can also sign up along with Good Friday walks and hikes at... MyPractice.Church, you can sign up for Easter Sunday just to let us know that you're coming. That would be amazing. We also want to let you know that what we've decided as a team is that it is time actually to transition back into in-person gatherings. It's been over a year for us. We've been very, very patient. And we just feel confident in creating a place and space for people in our community uh, that want to get back together. The thing we've noticed is that the best place for us probably to get together for the next season is in a church building, purely because church buildings have a um, kind of extra 
ability to gather together during this time. And so Goodwill isn't ready for us yet. And so the thing with gathering together in a church building is we can't use it Sunday mornings because most of these churches are gathering in their own building Sunday morning. And so we wanted to let you know, from Easter all the way to the end of June, we're actually going to be gathering weekly at 5 p.m. at Village Green Community Church. Again, they've been so great to us to say we can use their space. Just such gracious people. I'm really thankful for Pastor John and the team there. And we feel like it's a place that gives us ability to socially distance. They're also letting us use their equipment and different things in the room. It's going to be pretty simple, but we are excited to be able to do that. We know for some that 5 p.m. isn't crazy over ideal. We totally get that. But we kind of hope that if you're comfortable in gathering with us, that you would join in with us 5 p.m. on Sunday evening starting at Easter. We will take, um, as we always do, we'll take the long weekend off in May, and we will also not have in-person gatherings on Mother's Day and Father's Day. But every other Sunday throughout the spring season, we feel like Village Green's in a great spot, great place. We'll have worship, community, teaching together. To start, the kids will be in with us for our gatherings, but as that develops, we're also looking to potentially have kids' uh, spaces down the road. Um, we just want to kind of ease our way back in as a community to make sure that uh, we're doing what's right here. So we are excited about the future. Um, we hope you can join us. The other question is, uh, if, if you don't feel comfortable about gathering with us in person, we do plan to, if there's enough people, we do plan to hosting those live in-person gatherings on Sunday evenings on Zoom as well, giving you the opportunity to log in uh, if you can't be with us or uh, you're just not comfortable quite yet. We want to make sure that that's still available to you. So we'll give you an opportunity to log in to participate and watch our live gatherings as well. That's all I got for you for right now. We just hope that you'll join us and you'll join in and register with us for Good Friday, Easter Sunday. And we really are looking forward to getting back into this rhythm of uh, just gathering together on Sundays uh, in these spring evenings together. And we're gonna have some fun along the way. We're gonna engage some, in some thoughtful things I've, over the next few months. I really believe that is gonna be great. And it'll just be great to have families back together. The other thing, the church family back together. The other thing is if you do have children, there is an open foyer area there. So we don't want you not to come because you may think your kids are gonna be with you the whole night. There is an opportunity to sit. Um, there's, there's just, it's a great facility to be able to facilitate us and what we're hoping to do over the next few months. With all that said, I've said a lot here, teaching, bringing you up to speed. Um, what I would love to do is just pray. We're not gonna get into groups today. Um, we just hope you can join us over the next few weeks. Thanks for taking time on Sunday mornings to be with us online in this environment. And uh, as we take these next steps, just be in prayer for us as a community. And we also just want to be praying as well, just for the city and for just the moment we're in as far as the pandemic, that um, God would be with our community and protect us and lead us and guide us. But as we regather, I just hope that you will join us. So let me pray for you. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the things that we've been learning the last bunch of weeks and months. You love us. You've designed us. You've created us. God, may we walk in your love. Thank you for this community, for our team. I pray as we move forward that you would just Lead us, guide us. As we get back into worshiping together and focusing on you together, may you just do a deeper work within us. Thank you for every household at Praxis. Lead us and guide us, I pray. We love you, King Jesus. We ask that you would give us opportunity this week as we go into this city and the places and spaces that you're sending us. Give, give us opportunity. Help us to be attentive and aware of where you're leading and guiding us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, guys, grace and peace. Thanks for jumping in with us today, and we can't wait to see you next week as we jump online together, and uh, can't wait to see you at Easter. We'll see you soon.